Chapter Thirteen of the Great Pearl Secret. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Pearl Secret by Charles Norris Williamson. Chapter Thirteen. A Woman's Eyes, Mademoiselle Pavoya. This is Captain John Manners, just back from France, a cousin of the Duchess of Claremanagh's," said the manager, who was introducing Jack. Lida Pavoya lifted her drooping head a little, only a little, and fixed upon Manners a pair of dark eyes. A pair of dark eyes. Simple words and a simple act. There are many women in the world with dark eyes, and many had looked at John Manners. But these eyes of the Polish woman, as they gave that upward look from under heavy lashes, Manners felt himself a traitor. He had heard all sorts of stories about Lida Pavoya. He had gotten an impression that she was a tigress woman. And then, the dancing that he had seen her do was wild and barbaric. But tonight she was a swan. Her eyes were dark, but not black or even brown. They were perhaps a very deep greenish gray and extraordinarily luminous. Yes, that was the word. Luminous. Brilliant would be too hard. There was a mysterious moonlight sort of luminescence between the black fringes of the white lids and the whole face, pale, delicate, with pointy chin was mysterious as only Polish or Russian faces are. Why does she look at me so? Jack thought. It was almost as if she guessed, because he was Juliet's cousin, why he had asked for this introduction. He could not believe that she, who had met so many people, could recognize the man in evening dress as the officer in khaki she had seen at the fair doorstep. They were in a room at the theater where Mademoiselle Pavoya received privileged persons, a plainly furnished room, mostly gray, except for masses of flowers, and it suited her better than a background of fantastic color. Perhaps it was this grayness which made her stand out so vividly, and seem of such vital thrilling importance. She was extremely quiet in manner, and her voice was low, yet her quietness was disturbing, like that of a summer night when lightning may leap from a clear sky. Manners was struck dumb by her, Something had flashed from her eyes to his with that first look. It did not say merely, I am a woman, you are a man. It said, or seemed to say, you are the man. I am the woman. We had to meet. And now, what? He tried to think that this was a trick of hers, which she used on every male worthy of her steel. But he could not believe it to be so. Her perfume, that perfume of an eastern garden by moonlight, had gone to his head. No woman had ever produced such an effect upon him, though they had exchanged but a few words, and those not memorable. Yet he was not humiliated by his own surrender. In spite of all reason, he was convinced that she had been stirred by him as he by her. The meeting was between Pavoya's dances, and she had not many minutes to spare. Her manager had impressed upon manners that the few she gave were an immense concession— there was no hope of prolonging them. Her call came. She had to go. Again, eyes met with that shock to the nerves. Suddenly, Lida held out her hand to Jack, clasping it. Electricity flashed up his arm and stabbed at his heart. He felt her start slightly, and his breath quickened. For Juliet's sake, and the promise he had made, it was Manner's duty to take instant advantage of his luck with Pavoya. But he was not thinking about Juliet, or the promise. He was neither remorseful nor triumphant. All he thought of, or wanted as they talked in snatches, was to hold this woman, not to let her go till he had arranged to meet her again. He must meet her again. He must know what she really was, what they were to be in each other's lives. But he could not ask permission to call. He was stupidly tongue-tied, and could not put words together as he would have wished. "'Would you care to have supper with me at my house tonight?' she asked, not taking her hand from his. The invitation was so unexpected that Jack could hardly believe it had been given. Yet he heard himself answering, "'Yes, I should be delighted.' "'I am glad,' she said, in her perfect English, with the pretty accent that was part of her charm. "'Perhaps you don't know where I live. I have taken a house, furnished, Mrs. Lloyd Jackson's house on Park Avenue. You have been there?' Supper will be at twelve. Till then, she was gone. By jingo, you've made a hit, my boy. 
chuckled Pavoya's manager. It was all Jack could do to detach himself from thoughts of Lydda and go about Juliet's business between 10.40 and midnight. For the first time in his life, the prospect of seeing Juliet was distasteful to him. He didn't want to see her because she would ask him about Lydda Pavoya, and in his present mood, there was nothing he would hate worse than discussing the Polish girl with his cousin. But he was as sorry for Juliet as ever, and just as anxious to help her. Desperately, against the grain, he took a taxi and drove to the fair house, which he found brilliantly lighted. The huge front looked so gay that for a moment he hoped Pat had come back. But he asked for the Duke and was told gravely by Togo that his grace was not at home. The Duchess, however, was expecting Captain Manners. Juliet was waiting, not in her boudoir, but in the Chinese room which her father had loved. She no longer wore the dressing gown she had put on when nursing her headache in the afternoon, but was dazzling in some flame-colored film over shot gold and purple tissue. "'You've had good news?' Jack exclaimed at the sight of her. "'No, I've had none, whatever,' she said. "'If possible, things are worse. I know why you thought something good had happened, all the lights and this dress.' But if you were a woman, you'd understand. I've realized that there's a fight in front of me. I want it to be a silent battle. I don't wish people to know I'm fighting at all till I see what the end's likely to be. I do understand, Jack said. You're a brave girl, and I believe the end will be all right. He hurried on to talk about Pat, and thus put off the bad moment when she would question him about Pavoya. As nothing had been heard of the missing one, and Juliet seemed now even more anxious than angry, Jack decided to confess, having telephoned to all the hospitals. It was good news, he insisted, that these enquiries had drawn blank, and he did his best as comforter by saying that Pat had probably gone off in a huff. People who loved each other flew into rages more easily than those who didn't care. Men of Pat's temperament didn't lie down quietly to be trampled on by their wives. He'd write soon, or send word somehow when his first fury had exploded. Or, at worst, he would communicate with the bank, even if he didn't turn up for work there. Meanwhile, however, Jack admitted that they mustn't let things slide and merely hope for the best. Would Juliet like to have a detective engaged, a private one? Of course. Quietly, to make inquiries, in the very unlikely case that something queer had happened. Yes, I was going to suggest that, Juliet said in a hard, bright voice which kept back tears. What about that detective you spoke of? the one who was with Pat and De Fascal in the club. Jack hesitated. Well, I think we'd better get a chap of our own. You see, possibly he was Pat's man, engaged for the, the pearl business. He mightn't be able to work for us with a whole heart. I know what you mean. Juliet caught manners up. Pat's man may know where Pat really is and lead us off the track instead of onto it. It's just possible, Jack had to agree. Would you believe it? The girl veered abruptly to a new subject. Two reporters have called to interview me about the inner circle stuff. Impudent beasts, Manners lashed out. Of course you didn't receive them. Jack, I did, said Juliet. I'll tell you why. Here in the house, I've got more and more proof against Pat or against that woman. Jack winced, but she was not looking at him. Her eyes were full of tears. Still, I'm doing what you told me to do. I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. Besides, I've my pride, just as Pat has his. There's my father's name. In its way, that's as good as the name of Claremanagh, or all the dukes in Britain. I came to this room tonight because Dad loved it so, and I felt as if he were here in spirit, helping me to be strong. He was such a busy man, yet he always had time for me. I can almost hear his voice saying, Steady, Jewel, as he used to say when I was in one of my wild moods. I had those newspaper men brought to me here and I said to one what I said to the other. I admitted that I'd seen the inner circle, and I supposed the horrid rag meant us. But I simply laughed at the whole thing. I told them Pavoya came to see me, something about her dance for the Armenians. You know, the roof garden show Nancy Van Esten's getting up. I said the insinuation about the pearls was nonsense, that I'm an expert, and that they're the realest things I ever saw. I talked about Pat, as if we two were the best of friends and mentioned just casually that he was away for a few days. I was as nice as I could be to the men, though I longed to... to kick them. 
I'm sure they both went off to their hard old newspapers to write beautiful things about the family. Don't you think I did right? Perhaps, said Jack, if you don't mind being a bit infradig. I don't mind anything, Juliet choked. If only Pat comes back safely, and, and if we can patch up some sort of life together. If I don't have to break with him. Then you've given up those ideas you had this morning about divorce? No, I haven't exactly given them up, but they seem far off now, when I'm so afraid for Pat. I've thought of a thousand things that might have happened to him. Suppose he does love me, really, and Pavoya is jealous. She'd be capable of anything. She may have had him stabbed. That reminds me. You've met her? Yes. Well, what do you want me to say? To tell me what she was like, of course. How you got on. What have you got out of her? Jack felt suddenly antagonistic to Juliet. I was with Mademoiselle Pavoya, about twenty minutes at most, and her manager was there, too, he said. I've got nothing out of her. What did you expect? All the same, you may take it from me, Juliet. You'll be a big mistake if you imagine she has anything to do with Pat's not showing up. I'm sure she hasn't. Oh, she's hypnotized you too, has she? Snapped Juliet. Pat wanted to make me believe she was a good woman. Come with me into his study and I'll show you something. Then perhaps you won't be so quick to defend her. This was worse than Jack's fears. He couldn't refuse to follow his cousin. From everyone's point of view, that would be poor policy. But he hated to go to Pat's study. He did not wish to see anything Juliet had to show him there. If it's a letter, I won't... He began, when she cut him short. It isn't a letter. After the scolding you gave me at the Lorne, I wouldn't glance at the wildest love letter of Pavoya's, even if she'd printed it so large I could read every word across the room. I didn't give you a scolding, Jack defended himself. I only said a man wouldn't do what you did, or some such thing as that. Yes, that's just what you did say. Juliet was unlocking the door of Pat's study, of which she had the key. I never knew you not to do what you wanted to do because I or anyone else scolded you. How hard you are on me, Jack, she reproached him. This is different, and I am different. I don't want to do anything a man would think mean. I want to be fair to Pat, whatever happens. But about the pearls, I can't be fair to him and Pavoya both. I'm going to show you why not. As she spoke, she went to Pat's desk where things were wildly scattered as in his notorious carelessness he had left them. Jack Manor's heart beat rather thickly as he remembered his last visit to this room, how De Fiscal had come in, how he, Jack, had sat on the club fender, very conscious during the scene which followed that Lida Pavoya must be hidden behind the curtains or the screen, how he had advised Pat to do what De Fiscal asked, how Pat refused, and showed the safe in the wall which was already opened. Here's his seal ring, Juliet was saying, I found it lying on the desk. This is what I brought you in to see. Now take the ring in your hand, please. Look at it closely, and tell me if you notice anything odd. As Jack took the ring, he recalled that Pat had pulled it off his finger and given it to De Fascal, telling the Frenchman to compare it with the seals on the packet. Relieved that for a moment Juliet was letting Lydia's name rest in peace, he examined the ring. I see nothing peculiar, unless a tiny bit of red stuff stuck in the corner of the eye, he said. Ah, cried Juliet, I thought you'd see that. What do you think the red stuff is? Might be sealing wax. That's just what it is. I used a magnifying glass to make sure, which showed me something else too, but I haven't quite come to that yet. Pat never seals his letters with red wax. He dislikes red things. You know yourself he always uses gray-blue wax. He said it reminded him of my eyes. You saw the packet de Fascal brought from France? Yes. Then you know it was sealed with five red seals. I have the box and wrappings upstairs, if you don't remember. I do remember. Very well. You can guess what I'm driving at? I suppose I can. Good. Now, for the other thing, the magnifying glass told me, but no. Take it yourself. There's a scratch across the eye on the ring. You see it? Yes. Do you know who is supposed to have sealed up the packet? Man, of course, with a duplicate ring. Pat had made for him on purpose. 
Yes, a duplicate. But would the scratch have been copied? It shows on all five seals of the packet. I looked through the magnifier. Juliet, you accuse Pat. Or Pavoya. I said it must lie between him and her. Jack did not answer at once. He saw the sinister importance of this discovery which Juliet had made. His mind rushed back to yesterday. Lydia Pavoy had been left alone in the study for how long he did not know. But Pat had given her a chance to get away. He had made an excuse to show both men something in the Chinese room next door. Then, when Defascal pleaded an engagement, Pat had rung for Togo to guide the Frenchman out. A little later, Jack also had gone. What Pat had done after that, who could tell? His own man Nixon, perhaps, or one of the other servants. Jack pushed the name of Lyda Pavoya violently out of his mind. He would not ask himself what she knew about Pat's next movements and about the Red Seals. When these thoughts had shot through his head, bringing actual bodily pain, he drew a long breath and forced himself to speak. Juliet was waiting. It's very necessary to have a detective to tackle this business, he said. I realize that fact more than ever now. It's essential for Pat's own sake, if for no one else's. A sharp chap may be able somehow or other to pulverize this beastly theory you're forming, Juliet. He'll make tests for fingerprints on the safe in the wall. If there are others besides Pat's, of course. And little Pavoyas. It's not worthy of you to spring to such conclusions. Manners broke out before he could control himself. He expected Juliet to retort furiously, but she did not. She merely looked piteous and young. Jack, she said sadly, what am I going to do if that woman takes you away from me as well as Pat? Nonsense, he bluffed. I hope I shall show that she hasn't taken Pat. Or anything of yours. You don't want her proved guilty, I suppose. Not unless she is, but I'd rather it would be Pavoya than Pat, and it seems as if it must be one or the other. It seems so to you, now, but wait. Juliet looked at him anxiously. Can you think of anyone else to suspect? I haven't had much time to think yet, said Jack. Tomorrow morning early, I'll get the best private detective in town, one who won't talk. Meanwhile, we must be patient. I suppose, of course, you've questioned Nixon about his master. That was one of the first things I did. Poor old Nick was almost bowled over when I said I feared that something had happened to his adored one. I didn't mention the pearls, naturally, or that I thought Pat might have disappeared of his own accord. I watched Nick's face to see what he knew. I don't think he has an idea where Pat has gone, but, Jack, he knows something, something wild horses wouldn't drag out of him. I feel I have a... It's about Pavoya. I have an idea Nick has taken messages. Togo has been bribed by her too, I'm sure, and he won't speak. The woman is like Circe, with men of all sorts and classes, but she has but to look at them and turn them into beasts. The woman had looked at Jack, but she had not turned him into a beast. He had never felt less like a beast in his life than he felt at this moment. Yet, Saint or Circe... By some magic, she had won his loyalty. Wild horses would not have dragged her secrets from Nixon, Juliet said, and Jack believed she might be right. As for him, he would have had his tongue cut out sooner than tell his cousin that he was engaged to sup at Lydda's house, and it was almost time to go. What excuse could he make for leaving Juliet abruptly without hurting her? He would not hurt her for a great deal, but he would hurt her if he must, rather than be late. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of The Great Pearl Secret. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Pearl Secret by Charles Norris Williamson. Chapter 14. The house taken furnished by Lyda Pavoya belonged to a woman well known in society, who had gone abroad. Jack Manners had visited there before the war, but the drawing room was changed. There had been banal things in it. Now they were gone. Banality could not exist near Lyda. It seemed that in every form it must shrivel up, 
burnt away by the still fire of her strange, secret soul. Jack had pictured himself entering a room full of people, fellow guests, and finding no one, he feared that he had come too soon. If stage stars invited one for midnight, they probably meant one to turn up at half-past twelve, so that if they sailed in at one o'clock, one would not be annoyed. When the door opened five minutes after his arrival, therefore, he expected to see some theatrical or social swell, but it was Lydda who appeared, alone. He had never met her off the stage until yesterday, at the door of the fair house. Then she had been dressed in black and thickly veiled. He had guessed her identity from the extreme grace and slimness of her tall figure, and the flame of her red hair glimpsed through embroidered net. In Paris, where she had danced, he had sat too far away to criticize her features, and at the theatre tonight he had been dazzled by the wonder of her as a swan woman. Now, as she drifted in with the air of a tired, overworked girl needing rest, and mutely asking for help in securing it, Jack had the thrill of a new revelation. How many sides had this Polish dancer's nature? Was he to have a different sort of thrill every time he met her? Always more poignant? More soul-piercing than before? I'm glad to see you, she said. I thought I should be here first. I hope I've not kept you waiting. Not five minutes, Jack assured her. Good. Will you take off my wrap for me? When I heard you had come, I wouldn't wait for my maid. She had unfastened the emerald clasp of a long, oddly shaped cloak of purple velvet lined with clouds of green chiffon over gold. As Jack lifted it from her white shoulders, to his surprise he heard himself exclaim, I'd imagined you in sables. What right had he to make a personal comment like that? So other people have told me, she said. But I have one peculiarity. I never wear furs. To me it is horrible that women can cover themselves with the skins of lovely creatures, murdered for their pleasure, pathetic little faces and feet and tails, dangling all over them. No, when I was a child I suffered too much from the cruelty of the strong to the weak to find joy in profiting from it. By Jove! exclaimed Jack. I've thought sometimes of that sort of thing. But I didn't suppose it ever occurred to women, even the tenderest ones I've known. The women you have known haven't had childhoods like mine, said Lydda. Yet I hoped you'd not be one to make fun of my feeling. Another thing, I do not eat meat for the same reason. You will see at supper. But you shall have some, so don't be discouraged. As she spoke, she smiled, and Jack realized that it was the first time he had seen her smile. That was strange. Or it would have been strange in another woman. Now he saw that it would be more strange, altogether out of keeping with this character voluntarily opening itself to him, if she laughed or smiled often. Jack had obeyed a gesture of hers, and laid the faintly perfumed cloak on a sofa. Little wore a dress simple enough for the first dinner gown of a schoolgirl, gray and short, almost skimpy, yet somehow perfect, without a single touch of trimming or a jewel. Shall we go into the dining room? she asked. Supper will be ready. It always is. I never have it announced unless I've a party. Tonight it's only you and me. You'll not mind. Mind? The word spoke itself with a boyish sincerity that Jack could not have pretended. I didn't dare dream. She led the way through open sliding doors to an adjoining room not turning her head to listen as she let Jack push the half-drawn portiers aside. What a divine back she had, and what dimples in the delicate flat shoulder blades. An almost overpowering desire gripped Jack to kiss the white neck just where a knot of shining red hair was kept in place by a jade pin. He would no more have ventured upon a liberty with this creature of unfathomed reserves than he would have thrown himself into the cage of a tigress. All the same, he had definitely lost his head. He knew that he would have sacrificed Juliet and Pat for this girl, not deliberately, not through conviction, but because he couldn't help himself if it came to a choice. In the octagon-shaped room where its late mistress had given famous dinners, for eight, never less, never more, a small table was laid and lit with shaded candles, but no servants were there. Violets were scattered on the lace table cover, the only flower decorations. For the guests there were several elaborate cold dishes, 
and champagne and ice. For the hostess, brown bread and a jug of milk. When she saw Jack look at this, Little laughed out loud. I never take anything else at night, she explained. I suppose I'm a queer person. Probably you're thinking me odd in many ways. For one, to have you alone with me at supper. I've a companion who lives with me, Madame Le Mercier, a nice woman. But I do what I wish without thinking of conventions, if I hurt no one. People say so many things about me, they can say no worse, whatever I do. That's partly why I act as I please. Yet I think I'd do the same without an excuse. I invited you because I want to talk with you alone. No Madame Le Mercier, no servants. I'll wait on you myself. Not that, said Manners. You must let me wait on you. We'll wait on each other, she smiled. A sense of exquisite intimacy with this girl, or woman, he knew not what to call her, took possession of Jack. For a few minutes they ate, and he talked of anything that flashed into his mind. When Lydda had finished her milk, he jumped up and filled the glass again. Then she said abruptly, I recognized you at the theater from yesterday. Did you think I would? No, Jack reddened to his sun-bleached hair. But you must have known I was in Claremanagh's study when you were there. I wasn't sure. Yet you thought so. You're not a man who can lie well. And you are the cousin of Claremanagh's wife. You thought badly of me. I would no right to think badly. Jack staved her off. It wasn't my affair. I asked you here tonight to make it your affair. Jack had a shock of disappointment. That wonderful heart-piercing first look of hers which he had read, You are the man. I am the woman. Hadn't meant much after all. You see, Lydda went on, I think that perhaps you and I have known each other a long time. In another life, perhaps in more lives than one. Souls that have been friends, or more than friends. Grouped together on earth many times, no doubt. Did you feel this when we met tonight? Yes, Jack said, his breath choked. I know it must have been that. I knew even then it was the most wonderful thing ever. I felt it even yesterday, when I passed you at Claremanagh's door, she told him. I thought, there's a man I may never see again, but we could be friends. And we have been friends, though maybe he has forgotten. When I was in the study behind the curtains, Claremanagh put me there. He didn't want me seen. I was sorry you should believe things not true. I did not, Jack protested. No? Then I'm glad. The man felt ashamed, remembering suddenly what he had believed yesterday, even today. Her words, I am glad, cut him to the quick, and he hurried on along the way of atonement. You say you asked me here to make it my affair about Claremanagh. Tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. I don't know yet what is best. We will talk it over, she answered. But first you will have to hear a story. It's a long story, how I met Claremanagh, and a great many things that came of the meeting. You won't be bored. Do you need an answer to that question? Lydda gave him one of her rare smiles. No, it was conventional of me to ask. But it will not be conventional to tell you the story. It would be, even dangerous, to tell it to some men. I'm not afraid of you. Thank you for saying that. She held out her hand to him across the small round table. Jack seized it and pressed it closely instead of kissing the pink palm, as he was tempted to do. For a moment Lydda sat still, her eyes cast down, as if she sought for words which eluded her. Then she began in a low voice that was slightly monotonous, as though she spoke out of an old dream. She paused sometimes, but Manners remained silent, asking no questions. He felt that she would prefer this. She took him back with her to Petrograd, St. Petersburg then, when she was sixteen, ten years before. She was dancing in a second-rate café and attracted attention so that the place became popular. A man named Conrad Markov was the real owner, though he posed as an amateur patron. By his advice, the manager got Lydda to sign a hard and fast contract to dance at the same salary for the next five years. Markov pretended a fatherly kindness for her, and she was invited occasionally to visit his wife, 
a Frenchwoman who had lived for years in England. One night Markov brought a good-looking English boy of nineteen or so to the café. This boy applauded Lita's dancing, and was introduced to her at his own request, the Duke of Claremont. From the first he was enthusiastic about her talent. Not in love. Oh, not at all in love, Lita insisted. But anxious to help a budding genius. At the end of a week he had thought out a practical plan. He would pay for the dancing lessons of which she had dreamed, as of an impossible paradise, lessons from the great Sofia Verasova. It would cost a lot, yes, but he had just had a few unexpected thousands left to him by an aunt. If Lida wouldn't accept, they were sure to be spent on some foolery. She did accept. Perhaps she might have accepted even if Clermont hadn't made it quite clear how impersonal, how disinterested were his motives. Never, the dancer confessed had she met a good man in those days. She would have made an idol of this handsome boy, but he didn't want her idolatry. He was fancying himself in love with the wife of a don at Oxford just then. To free her from slavery at the café, Claremont paid a big indemnity, and at the time Lida was grateful to Markov for arranging the business, not then aware that he was the power behind the throne. It was nearly two years later when the truth was sprung upon the girl just as she expected to go with Verasova to make her debut in Paris. Markov had wished her to be educated and become a great dancer without expense to himself. There were several ways in which she could be valuable, and unless she promised her services to him, he would prevent her from leaving Petrograd. Claremont had been too carelessly trustful to have the release from her contract framed in a legal document, and Lilith could still be compelled to carry it out, unless she agreed to use the charm she had the fame she might win, in the secret service of Russia she would thus be compelled. Lida was not old enough to understand the hideousness of this bargain. She wasn't yet eighteen, and not to go with Verasova would have seemed worse than death. It was only later, when she had soared to brilliant success, that she realized fully what she was expected to do. Engagements were offered to her in the capitals of different countries, after Paris, Rome, and then London. She met many men of distinction, sailors, soldiers, diplomats, financiers. She was to flirt with these men, just how seriously was her own affair, and get them inadvertently to tell her things useful to the Tsar's government. Well, she had flirted, but she had sickened at the business behind the flirtations. Very little information reached Russia through Lida Pavoya. Reproaches and threats came to her from Markov and as a warning of what he could do to bring about her ruin if he chose, Russians in England, France, Italy, America, set the ball of scandal rolling against her. According to them, she was a professional siren, a mercenary bloodsucker, a tigress woman, a devourer of men's happiness and honor. Against such a campaign, a woman, placed as she was, found herself helpless. She could only shrug her shoulders, go her own way, and try not to care. But the war, like an ill wind that blows good to some, changed the world for Lida. She worked heart and soul in Paris for the Red Cross. The Russian Revolution broke like a red sunrise, and with the end of the Tsardom, she hoped that Markov's power over her would end also. For some months she had no word from him. Then he appeared in Paris, at a bad moment for her. Clermont had been there on leave, he had come to her house complaining that he felt ill. At luncheon he had fallen from his chair in a dead faint. The doctor had pronounced the attack a virulent case of influenza. Clermont couldn't be moved. Lida, helped by Madame Le Mercier, had nursed him. He thought she had saved his life, vowed that he owed her more than she had ever owed him. There was endless gossip, of course, but Lida had been so glad to repay her debt of gratitude that she hadn't much cared. It was soon after Clermont had gone back to the front, and while people were still coupling their names in the scandalous way, that Conrad Markov arrived in Paris. At last the time has come when you can be of real use to me, he had said. Lida had hoped this was bluff, but Markov explained. He explained things of which she had never dreamed. With brutal frankness he told the girl that he had made Clermont's acquaintance in Petrograd for a very special purpose. He had married his French wife because she had been maid to the young Duchess of Clermont and knew something about the famous pearls. Always he and men associated with him 
had kept track of the family fortunes. He had known that the boy intended to visit the scene of his ancestor's great romance. Had it not been for some treachery, he believed that his own wife had sent anonymous warnings to the Clermanaws, the lost treasure would long ago have returned to Russia. Now, though his associates were dead or in Bolshevik prisons, and the crown was a legend, he, Markov, wanted the pearls for himself. Lida had more than repaid Clermanaw's generosity, all of which, Markov argued, she owed directly to him. She was in a position to demand any favor she liked of the Duke. She must get him to lend her the Serena pearls. If she refused to do this, she should be denounced as a spy. Even though her activities had been stopped by the revolution, the war was still on. Markov had letters which would convict her. She, the adored one, the divine dancer, would be tried and shot some morning at dawn. It would be nothing to die, Lida had thought. But she loved France. She could not bear to die as a traitor. What to do, then? Suddenly a plan came to her. She agreed to ask Clermanoff for the pearls. You see, she explained to Manners, Markov had had a copy made from an old portrait of the Serena. He meant me to hand him over the real pearls and give the false to Clermanoff, but he didn't know that Clermanoff's mother had had them copied. Hardly anyone did know, but Clermanoff had told me, and it was the copy that I asked him to lend. He couldn't bear to refuse my very first request. Poor fellow. He hated to grant it, though. But it was just after he'd fallen in love with Miss Fair, before they were engaged. There was enough talk about him and me, without my wearing those well-known pearls. It was part of my bargain with Markov to pair with him in public, for he wanted my name to be coupled with Clermanaugh's. It would give me power over his future, and even if the Duke told people that he was lending me a copy, they wouldn't believe it. They would have laughed at the idea of Pavoya accepting false pearls. Clermanaugh sent to London for the things. My wearing them made a sensation. Markov was wild with rage when he saw what they were. Wild against Clermanaugh, not me. He believed that I had been tricked. Of course the copy was of no use to him. He did not take it. But he would not let me give it back to the Duke. He was working up a scheme of blackmail against us both. I dared not disobey. And once the mischief was done by my wearing the rope, Clermanaugh didn't much mind whether I kept it or not. I pretended to forget, and he didn't mention the subject. Then I got this surprise offer to dance in New York. I was so glad. I thought I might get rid of Markov. How foolish. He sailed in the ship with the Duke and Duchess, but kept out of their way. Clermanaugh never knew he was on board, and perhaps wouldn't have remembered him from those old Petrograd days if he had seen his face. Now we come to these last few days in New York, Lida finished. Do you begin to see Markov's game? Not quite, Jack answered. It was the first time he had spoken since she began her story. It isn't clear to me yet, at least where Pat Clermanaugh is concerned. It wasn't to me at first, but Markov made it clear. He didn't try direct blackmail against the Duke. He was afraid, I think, that Clermanaugh would fight, even though he'd hate scandal for his wife's sake. I was the cat's paw. Markov really did have letters which I sent to him in those hateful days, when I had to content him with a pretense of spying. There were always those to hold over my head, and he threatened to order the wearing of those wretched false pearls again as an open insult to the Duchess. He thought that, for answer, she would wear the real ones. Then he would be sure they were in New York, and he might have the chance at last which he had been trying for all these years, the chance to steal them. By Jove, you are unraveling the whole mystery, Jack broke out. But Lida shook her head. No, I'm afraid you'll not think that when you've heard what's to come, she said. I'm afraid I shall make the mystery even deeper. I was faced with shame for myself and the ruin of Clermont's happiness, through my fault, my seeming selflessness. The alternative was money, oh, but a great sum of money, enough to console Markov for giving up his hope of the pearls. Never till then had I told Clermont of Markov's tyranny. But for his own sake and mine I had to explain something. We consulted about what was best to be done. Clermont wished to do what he called wave the red flag, but I made him realize what his wife's feelings would be if he were mixed up in such a case of law with me. 
At last we agreed that it would be wise to pay Markov and be free of him. I earn a great deal of money and spend it. It took some time to get the sum together. I sold nearly all my jewels, and what I didn't sell, I pawned. Still there wasn't enough, and Clermont came to the rescue. He said it was for himself, but of course it was far more for me. It was only when the money was every sou in hand that I dared give back the imitation pearls. I went to do that when you met me at the door. To do that, and to hand Clermont two-thirds of the hush money for Markov. The rest he had ready in his safe. He offered, he wanted, to meet the man and exchange the money for the letters. Now, Captain Manners, you know the whole history of the pavoya Clermont affair. But perhaps you don't yet understand all the reasons why I've told it two hours after we were introduced to each other, you and I. Her eyes challenged him. Jack saw that she wished him to understand, so he did not mean to make a mistake. He thought before he spoke. I wonder, he said. I could be more sure where I am if I knew whether you're in the secret of Pat's doings tonight. Little looked puzzled and pale. His doings? Tonight? No, last night I saw Markov and got back the letters. But tonight's doings, no. I'm not in the secret, if there is a secret. Jack caught at her words. He was intensely excited by what she had told him, but kept his outward coolness. Lida had gone through a great strain. He did not care to alarm her needlessly. You say Pat saw Markov and got the letters. You're sure of that? Yes, he sent me the letters with a short note just after receiving them, saying all was right. Did the note come from home? No, from a club. The Grumblers. It was written rather late. Didn't Pat say anything about himself? Where he was going from the club? What had happened since you met? Or what he meant to do today? Nothing, except he was riding in a hurry, after settling up with Markov and seeing the last of him, for he had something rather important to do. That was all. Absolutely all. Captain Manners, you look strange. What have you to tell me in exchange for my story? Why, to begin with, I don't understand as I thought I did why you've told it, Jack stammered. I imagined it was because you knew Pat and my cousin had quarreled, that he had left her, or anyhow disappeared, and you wanted me to justify you with Juliet. Lydia stared at him across the table, her hand suddenly pressed over her heart. Mon Dieu, she whispered. Clermont disappeared? But, went on Jack, collecting his wits, if you didn't know, what did you mean when you said that Markov's hand in the pearl business didn't clear up the mystery, but only made it more mysterious? I meant, of course, those innuendos in that horrible paper, the hints that the Duchess was wearing false pearls. It is not to Markov's advantage to start such a rumor now. He has nothing to gain. No longer any hold over Clermont or me. He would do himself no good, but much harm. Oh, Captain Manners, where can the Duke be? I came here tonight racking my brains vainly as to that, Jack encouraged her. Now, thanks to you, I've something to go upon, something to tell the detective whom I shall see first thing tomorrow. This Markov is my starting point now. His scheme of years is to steal the pearls. How he can have got into the house, open the safe, taken the things out of the box, and sealed it up again with the false pearls inside. I can't see yet, but... Lida sprang to her feet. You say he has done that? Someone has done that. You, uh, Pat didn't tell you in his letter? About what had happened to the box you must have seen? No, no, he didn't mention the pearls or the box. Who discovered the theft? Juliet. Pat gave her the sealed packet, and... She's rather an expert. She found the pearls were false. Yet she wore them. Yes. Then that was because she thought I. Don't say it. Can you say it wasn't her thoughts? She accused her own husband, whom she adores. Or me. Was that not it? Jack was silent. With a little cry, Lida covered her face with her hands, and he saw that she trembled. Hardly knowing what he did, he went to her took the two cold hands and held them to his lips. She looked up to him with eyes bright with tears, and the next instant she was in his arms. We'll work together, he said, you and I. We'll drag this mystery up by the roots. 
We'll find Pat, wherever he is, and Juliet shall beg your pardon on her knees. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of The Great Pearl Secret This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Pearl Secret by Charles Norris Williamson Chapter 15 The Fortune Teller Manners did not go to his hotel when he left Lydda. He walked for miles. He was happy. He was proud. He was wretched. He was ashamed. He believed in Lydda Pavoya. He doubted her. There would not have been room for the volcano of his feelings between four walls. That moment when he had held her in his arms had been the most wonderful, if not the greatest, in his life. But it had been only a moment. Her surrender for a few seconds had seemed to him then the most exquisite thing in the world. The childlike longing for a man's chivalrous protection in the heart of a woman who had known little chivalry. In an instant she had drawn herself gently away, and he had not held her. He had wished Lydda to know that if he did not understand everything, at least he understood why she had crept into his arms for that brief breathing space, and that he would take no advantage of her yielding. He had armored himself with an almost exaggerated friendliness afterward, and for a while they had talked not at all of themselves, but of Juliet and Pat. They tried to form some theory which might account for the disappearance of the pearls from the locked safe whose combination was known to only two persons. The replacing of the parcel there, sealed with fresh seals. They had striven to implicate Markov in the affair, but all their deductions stumbled against the same blank wall in the end. It seemed impossible that Markov could even have entered the house, much less have got into the study or opened the safe. Lydda did not know how Pat had obtained the money to help her out with the payment to Markov. It had not seemed strange to her that he should have it. Looking back, it seemed strange now, yet it was incredible that he should have juggled with the packet and risked losing his wife's respect by palming off false pearls on her in order to get money for another woman. Incredible. And yet Lydda said, like one in a dream, that he was the only person who could have done the thing, except herself. I know I didn't do it. And yes, I know he didn't do it she cried to Jack. So again, and again, they came through darkness to that blank wall, and at last, deadly tired in body and brain, Lydda sent Manners away. He was all exultation at first. The glamour and perfume of her ran through his veins. She was noble, magnificent. It was great of this glowing creature to trust him so generously, to tell him her life story, putting herself in his power in a way, for the sake of Claremanagh's happiness. It was fine of her to say he might repeat all to Juliet, who, Lydda must know, detested and distrusted her with the obstinacy of a spoiled, jealous child, to say that, if necessary, a detective might be trusted with her secrets. But as the chill of the night iced his veins, Jack's mood changed. Juliet's point of view suddenly showed itself sharply to his eyes. It was as if she had come from round the corner of the last street he had passed to walk with him. Had Lydda told him the story for Claremanagh's sake and Juliet's? Why not for her own, in the daring wish to make a friend at court? Would that not be more like her, more like the woman she was supposed to be? She knew that he had seen her go into the fair house, that he must have guessed she was hidden in the study, that he was Juliet's cousin and would naturally be inclined to work for Juliet's interests. Would it not be a bold and clever stroke to win him to her side? If it were some other man, not himself, whose prejudices had been thus broken down in an hour by a woman's eyes and voice, wouldn't he pity the poor idiot who believed that he alone fathomed the depths of her smile? Lydda practically admitted that she had fooled many men. Some of them had doubtless known far more about women than he knew, why, she must have been laughing at him all through. He had been a child in her hands. Lies that were half-truths could be welded into a fabric hard to break down. No doubt there were true details in that life story of Pavoya. But how many true ones? 
and was it fine of her to consent that he should tell Juliet, and if necessary, a detective? Wasn't that just what she'd worked up to and wanted? Wasn't she purposely turning suspicion toward Pat when she said, as if dazed, that only he or she could have changed the pearls? Jack heard himself again, warmly promising that they too should work together, that they'd drag up the mystery by the roots, and that Juliet should beg her pardon. A spider's dainty web of opal gauze glittering with dew must look a fairy palace to a big blundering blue bottle. Did such a man as Markov from Petrograd even exist? Dawn flowed like a pale river through the canyons of the New York streets when Manor's walk ended at his own hotel. He felt as if he had been through a battle, a battle that he hadn't won. But a cold splash and then dead sleep for an hour braced him physically. He woke with a start, as if somebody had knocked, yet no one was at the door. The thought of food disgusted him. Hot, strong black coffee, however, was refreshing. It was early still, yet he was sure that Juliet would be awake, and called her up, learning at once that she had no news. Yes, he had things to tell, he answered her eager question. Not news exactly, but important. Before going to her, however, he intended to see the detective they'd talked about. A man named Henry Sanders, used to be in the police. Sharp chap, had the nickname of Hawkeye Harry. Retired, but got bored with doing nothing and started as a private detective. Had made a big success in the last few years. Absolutely to be trusted. Silent as the grave and sharp as a razor. Jack added that he knew the man personally, and, as he didn't wish to wait for office hours, would ring Sanders up at his own house. He would call there and tell the man something of the case to save Juliet useless questions and answers. Then, he hoped, they could both come round to see her. As it turned out, however, Manners went alone to the fair house. He had not seen Sanders, the detective, to whom Jack had vainly tried to phone the night before, had not yet returned from the country, where he had spent the last few days. He had luckily left word that he would be at his office by ten o'clock, and having sent a request for an immediate appointment there, Jack was ready for a talk with his cousin. It was hard to put Lyda Pavoya's case impersonally and impartially to Juliet. As he framed the story in his own words, he saw Lyda again as he had seen her last night, heard her sweet, vibrating voice with its delicious accent. The glamour of the woman took possession of him once more. He tried to be judicial, but he could be so only in manner. Telling the tale, he was impressed with the way detail after detail fitted itself into probability. And as Juliet's face showed how the door of her mind shut against Lydda, his own opened. He had left Lydda and had become her judge. Juliet's silent antagonism made him again Lydda Pavoya's defender. I don't believe one word, Juliet flamed out when he had finished. Manners found himself quite unreasonably angry, he, who had walked the streets raging against his own weakness for Pavoya. You wanted me to get her story, he said. Well, I've got it, and all you have to say is that it's a pack of lies. I can do no more. Juliet felt stricken. Do you mean you take it all as gospel truth yourself? She challenged. It seems to me to hang together perfectly. It would. She's clever as a serpent. Jack frowned. You don't seem pleased to have your own husband turned into a hero instead of a villain. Color flew to Juliet's pale cheeks. I don't need Lydda Pavoya to do that for me. Then, said Manners coolly, you make this distinction. You believe the good part about Pat and not the good part about her. Juliet broke into tears. Oh, Jack, she reproached him. I might have known... You've gone over absolutely to the enemy. Jack was conscience-stricken, for in a way it was true. He tried to console the girl as he had consoled her yesterday, and in the old days when she was a child. There was no enemy, he said, or at all events the enemy wasn't Mademoiselle Pavoya. It was essential that they should at least seem to work in harmony. Juliet must trust him. She must pull herself together and be ready soon to see the detective. The Duchess was quieter when he had argued for a while and patted her shoulder and called her darling child. She dried her tears and promised to be good, 
But when Jack had gone to keep his appointment at Sanders' office, her heart was led. He's Pavoya's man now, she said to herself. Having Lydia's permission to speak, and knowing Sanders to be trustworthy, Manners kept nothing back. He began with a brief outline of the history of the pearls and Pat's business transaction with Mayan. This brought him to the arrival of the messenger with the packet and its delivery in his own presence. There, for the first time, Sanders stopped him and asked questions. What had been Defascal's manner? What the Duke's? And Jack believed that his answers impressed the detective favorably toward the Frenchman. It proved the messenger's bona fides that he had insisted upon the opening of the box in his presence. Besides, after the theft, it appeared certain that the new seals had been made with the Duke's ring, and before that could have happened, Manners had seen De Fiscal leave the house. Sanders would, of course, wish to meet De Fiscal, but would prefer to talk with the Duchess first of all. Whether Mademoiselle Pavoya's version of her visit to the fair house and her acquaintance with the Duke were true remained to be seen. Sanders had never heard of Markov, but would take immediate steps through the aid of his best boys to find out all about the man, if he existed. As for the Duke, the detective didn't mind admitting to Jack as a friend, not in an official capacity, that he didn't yet believe there had been foul play. He wasn't sure that in Claremanagh's place, assuming his injured innocence, he wouldn't have gone away to punish his wife. "'These spoiled heiresses are the limit when they get going,' he said." And this Duke chap's Irish. I'm Irish myself. We fellows can't sit still even when the prettiest woman forgets the Marquis of Queensbury's rules in a scrap. It gets our goat. Jack was not sure whether Juliet would prefer an outside opinion that Pat had been kidnapped or had left her of his own free will. But the girl's pale beauty bowled Sanders over at first sight. His prejudice against the spoiled heiress melted like ice in morning sunlight, and his Irish heart, as well as his trained discretion, kept back any word which he thought might wound her. The assumption, meant to be comforting, that with Markov lay the clue to the mystery, was, however, salt on an unhealed scar for Juliet. She took it instantly for granted that Sanders agreed with Jack in believing Lydia Pavoya had told the truth. They're going the wrong way to work, she thought bitterly, when the two men had gone, promising a report the moment there should be news of any sort. The wrong way! If they find out where Pat is, it will be just blundering. By accident. It thwarted wretchedness, the girl realized that it would be worse than useless to make such protests to Sanders. He was the detective, not she, though he had complimented her upon her smartness in the matter of the ring and the magnifying glass. He would only pity and despise her for jealousy and prejudice if she gave him the advice she burned to give. And Jack, Jack was hopeless. He was lost to her. She felt as miserably alone as if Jack had not promised to be her knight, and as if he had not brought to her one of the best private detectives in the land. She longed to strike out on her own account, to be first in the field, and be able to say to these men, See, while you were wandering all round Robin Hood's barn, I found the place where the secret was buried, and dug it up. It was mostly about Pat that Juliet thought, and his disappearance. Upon the pearls she wasted little anxiety, though she hated to think that Pavoya should have them. She had cried out to Pat that she believed not one word of the dancer's story, and she had meant it at the time. But brooding alone over the history of Pavoya's years and the link between her and Pat, Juliet found herself almost arbitrarily accepting certain details here and there. Yes, that must have been the way those two first met. Pat had told her that he had heard the call of romance in Russia, his great-great-grandfather's romance, and had left Oxford to spend the long vacation among those scenes. How like Pat at nineteen to create a romance of his own on the same spot. Her heart yearned to Pat with the thought that he had helped Pavoya because of charity, not love. In that case, he had told the truth, or as much truth as his wife could expect of a man where women were concerned. But certainly, Juliet assured herself, Pavoya had loved Pat and moved heaven and earth to compromise him. That was really why she asked him to lend her the pearls. No doubt she'd begged for the real ones, and he'd lent her a copy. She'd kept the wretched beads, not because of some melodramatic blackmail stunt, but because she wished to wear them as if they were real. 
and get herself talked about with Pat. Then he'd married, and having sent to France for the true pearls for his wife, he couldn't leave the false ones knocking about for Pavoya to play with. He'd practically ordered the woman to return them, and in revenge, when an amazing chance came her way, Pavoya had somehow stolen the genuine rope, changing the contents of the packet. It all seemed clearer and clearer to Juliet, and she wondered that a man with such good brains as Jack could be so easily deceived. In pride of her own superior talent as a detective, the girl would have had moments of triumphant joy had it not been for her wearing anxiety about Pat. Days passed. Pat did not return or write to Juliet or the bank, and no news of importance was obtained for her by Sanders or Jack. Markoff, the detective, was unable to trace by name, though he had got upon the track of a Russian who had lately arrived in New York with some good introductions. His description answered that given of Conrad Markoff by Mademoiselle Pavoya. Boris Halbin, who had figured at various New York clubs and was now supposed to have sailed for France, was a person of inconspicuous appearance. So too was Markoff. Many Russians over 40 are darkish, stoutish, big-faced, blunt-featured, with beards turning gray. Juliet bravely kept up the fiction with her friends that she and Pat were on the best of terms. He was away on business for the bank. He would soon return. That story about the pearls being false was too silly for words. The reason she'd stopped wearing them was because she had broken the string and didn't want the responsibility of choosing the person to mend it till Pat came back. The girl would have given thousands of dollars for the privilege of sporting her oak, and refused to see the many people whose devotion she attributed to curiosity. But for the sake of the future, and her own pride's sake, she would not do that. She went out a good deal, kept all her engagements, and made new ones. Her nerves, however, revenged themselves upon her mercilessly. Once she had hardly realized that she possessed such things as nerves. Now they made themselves felt each moment of the day, and through hours of the long, restless nights. Against his will, Sanders had consented to an advertisement appearing in the personal column of several papers. Juliet had pleaded that no one would know for whom it was meant, and she would die if she couldn't put it in. Consequently, curious eyes in many cities of the United States were reading every day this appeal. Playboy, American Beauty, believes in you and wants you. Write or come back if you would not break her heart. Who could guess that the Duchess of Claremont's pet name for the Duke was Playboy, and that he had sent her American Beauty roses every day since they were engaged, because it was the name he had found sweetest, most appropriate for her. Yet someone must have guessed because in the inner circle, a week after the sensational pearl whisper, the secret was given away. No names were mentioned, yet none who knew the Claremonaz could have avoided reading between the lines. It was while Juliet sat with the paper in her hands, shamed, bewildered, almost stunned, that a sealed envelope was brought on a tray to her boudoir. Mechanically, she opened it. Within was a visiting card, with something written upon it in pencil. For an instant, the girl's bruised brain could not find the Comtesse de Saint-Ville in the index of her memory. Then, suddenly, she saw the woman, playing opposite her at some bridge table. Yes, of course, little Pavoya's friend. Forgive my calling uninvited. I hope you can see me. I have something to say which may be important to you. The woman, whom Juliet vaguely disliked, had scribbled in French under her name. Juliet thought for a minute, with the card in her hand. It seemed pushing of this person to come, and probably, if she, Juliet, consented to see her, she would regret the weakness. Still, the one really important thing on earth was news of Pat. Madame de Saint-Ville might know something. She might have quarreled with Pavoya and be ready to give her away. Bring the lady up here, the Duchess instructed Huji. Presently, the visitor was shown in and Juliet, rising to receive her, towered like a tall young goddess over a small, smart creature, painted to look as pretty as she thought she ought to be. She'll begin to speak of Pavoya, Juliet thought, but she was mistaken. I have come on a very queer errand, were the Countess's first words, spoken with much throaty rolling of R's. Perhaps you will be angry. I made up my mind only today that it was my duty to call. 
Her eyes darted to the inner circle, which Juliet had just thrown aside, and quickly returned to a flower, with which she, herself, was playing. But Juliet read that side glance, to mean, After reading that paper today, I decided. When people tell one it's a duty to say or do something in particular, it's generally disagreeable, Juliet said dryly. Ah, this is an exception. It is not disagreeable at all. I hope it is only unusual, replied the Comtesse de Sainville. But I will not keep you in suspense. Have you ever heard of a palmist and fortune teller named Madame Venot? Possibly. I'm not sure, answered Juliet, surprised. She is not, or rather, she has not been fashionable, I think, explained the other. I have not lived long enough in New York to know these things. I happened to hear of her through a friend of mine, yours also, is it not? Miss Billy Lowndes. It was there I met you once. Mrs. Lowndes knew I was interested in the psychic things, crystal gazing, palmistry. She spoke of Madame Venot, who was supposed to be only a manicurist. Her real profession is a secret. It has to be. It seems that Madame Venot is a name several women have used, like, one would say, a trade name because they have hired the same rooms or offices, and Madame Veneau manicurist is on a door plate. That is odd, is it not? But the first Madame Veneau died, or something. The present one is... Ah, Duchess. She is marvelous. She has told me things about myself, but things only le bon Dieu ou le diable had in their knowledge. Naturally, I have been to her more than once. Last time she looked through her crystal... I do not know if that is forbidden by your law. En tout cas, she does it. The picture she saw must have been strange. It seemed to frighten her. When I asked some questions, she said the vision was not for me. It was for another. Why it came, she could not tell unless that person was in my thoughts. Then, Duchess, she spoke your name. The picture was for you. Really? exclaimed Juliet. She pretended to be amused. But the woman's tone was meant to impress, and did impress, the girl in spite of herself. What did the picture represent? Madame Venot did not mention, except that it concerned the Duke. She felt it would be wrong to speak, if not to you alone. She wished me to give you a message, to say, if you would come to her place, she would look again in the crystal, and tell you what she saw. I did not like to call on you. I am not long enough of your acquaintance. But today, don't be afraid to speak out what's in your thoughts, Juliet said with a painful smile. You have read the inner circle. You think the disgusting whisperer is right, that the advertisement which people have been talking about is mine. Of course, that's all nonsense. Please tell everybody you meet who is interested in my affairs, but probably you meant to be kind. Anyhow, I think fortune tellers are great fun. I shall go to this one someday soon, when I have time. You'll give me the address? Par coincidence, Madame Venot is in the same building with that journal de Blas, replied the Comtesse. It goes without saying that they have no connection, one with the other. It is a mere accident. Mrs. Lowndes has told me that the first woman of that trade name, Madame Venot, was really a manicurist. So it was necessary to have an office and not be in a private house in some quiet street. I see, said Juliet. I must thank you for coming. As Madame knows my name, she must know a good deal about me, so her pictures won't be as exciting as if I went to her a stranger, but they may be amusing. Her tone, though perfectly courteous, was meant to end the interview. Madame de Sainville rose. Juliet did the same, and rang. The moment she was alone, she ran to her bedroom and commanded Simone, who was there to give her a hat and coat. She had said she would go some day, to Madame Venot, but she was going now, at once. At once. End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 of The Great Pearl Secret. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Pearl Secret by Charles Norris Williamson Chapter 16 The Grey Room 
Pat Claremanagh floated in a grey sea, under a grey sky. It seemed to him that the grey sea and sky were part of some existence after death. He vaguely remembered that he had died. If it were not for the constant heavy pain in his head, he thought that he could recall the whole incident. Yes, that was the word. Incident. It hardly mattered now, and wasn't worth while racking his brain over. That tin hat of his was too tight, much too tight. But he was too weak to lift his hands and take it off. Strange, though, that he should be wearing it when he was dead. He must have been killed in the war. Yet how long ago the war seemed. He had thought that a great many things had happened to him after the war. No doubt they were part of this dream, this long, floating dream, after death. But they were not grey like the leaden sea and the sky that hung so low over his head. They were beautiful, colourful things. Just straining to remember brought rainbow flashes across his brain. Out of these lights the girl's face looked at him. Juliet, he heard himself mutter in a thick, tongue-tied voice instantly another face appeared and blotted out that of the girl this one was solid and very real it bent over him in the greyness a man's face somehow familiar as if he had known it long ago long ago disliked it a fleshy bulk surrounded with hair he loathed it for itself and hated it for shutting out the vision of juliet so he closed his eyes for a moment consciousness died down like a fading flame. Only a vast, vague greyness was left, and the tight pain of the tin hat. But when a few moments or a few years had passed, a voice spoke. It beat upon his dulled intelligence like the strokes of a clock in the dark, telling an hour. Pat was suddenly keyed up to listening, because it was a woman's voice, and far down within himself he was aware that a woman's voice, a certain woman's voice, was what he yearned to hear. Strange! He was wide awake, and knowledge came to him that he was not dead after all, though he might be close to death. But he did not open his eyes, because he could not bear to see the living mass of flesh and hair again. He lay quite still, and he listened. "'You are always hanging over him like that whenever I turn my back,' said the woman. "'Why not? I do no harm,' answered a man's voice, with a rather soft, monotonous, foreign accent. Pat knew that the voice belonged to the face. It also had association with long past things, which were somehow important. A scene began forming in his tired mind, like bits of an old picture being matched together a room with tables and men drinking and smoking a cleared space a kind of stage a girl dancing slim lovely light as a fawn long red hair waving back and forth lida that was her name lida something he was at one of the tables very young only a boy and the hairy man sat with him talking praising the girl markoff he stopped remembering and listened again you'd do harm if you dared to the woman said you'd like to kill him i think it will be better for us all if he die said the man much better much safer but no violence let him go fade away i thought it would soon be finished with him then he open his eyes and look at me you hear him speak some word yes i heard him the woman answered it's the first time he's made a sound since except a sort of groaning i'm jolly glad we don't want him to drop off the hooks not much you are very foolish madam he can give your husband and the others away it is only me who have nothing to fear he do not see me there yet i am witness against any ones who treat me wrong pooh said the woman you are always harping on your powers to hurt us it's nil the hunt's out for you 
mr markoff or halbin or whatever you like to be if we're keeping you for our own sakes because you haven't paid up anyhow it's your game to lie low you daren't show your nose outside this door but for heaven's sake let's stop arguing i'm for nothing in that part of the business you have all got some plan you try to work behind my back growled the man i tell you enough times the money will come when it comes you'll get the pearls if it comes in time that's the rub the word pearls was like a key it unlocked the door of pat's memory and impressions flowed in but they were confused without beginning or end and he lay motionless hoping for more clues he was conscious that the woman leaned over him she brought with her a heavy oriental perfume and he felt a waft of warm breath on his face are you awake she asked speaking slowly do you know what happened to hurt you eh pat did not show by the quiver of an eyelid that he had heard when he come back to himself by and by he will remember everything perhaps and then where will you all be the man wanted to know he never will remember unless there's someone to give him the tip people don't remember with concussion the woman said so that was what he had concussion of the brain pat wondered how he had got it one of the impressions filtering back was of hitting a man and hearing him squeal what had followed was a blank like everything since maybe some other man had hit him from behind the woman moved away and cautiously pat opened his eyes the greyness was still there but it was more definite more commonplace as if belonging to earth and things of everyday life he thought that he must be lying on his back in a bed looking straight up at a low grey ceiling there were grey walls too but he could not turn his head to see more as his neck was stiff and painful the light was so dim that he imagined it must be drawing toward dusk in a room with small windows partly covered with curtains more talking went on at a distance between the man and woman sometimes it sounded so far off that pat wondered if there was an adjoining room with an open door presently when all had been silent for so long that he had almost dozed off there was a sudden explosion of voices the listener fancied that there were two new ones both voices of men and one he recognized though irritatingly he could not attach the right name label he kept his eyes closed because he was sure that the latecomers would look at him and his caution was rewarded someone turned on a light the two new voices mumbled in sick-bed whispers across his pillow he caught a word here and there again the pearls markoff and the duchess the last gave him an odd thrill juliet she had been angry how was she feeling now was she seeking for him or did she give him credit for running off with the pearls or lida or both together the thought that this might be so probably was so made him long to spring up and fight his way to his wife somehow and perhaps he could not have resisted attempting to move had not a sudden noise snapped the thread of his thought a quarrel had broken out over something between the men all three voices rose sharply the woman intervened and was rebuked then came a squall of rage instantly stifled the woman screamed and drew in her breath with a gasp all was still again hark whispered someone the light went out in place of the greyness blackness fell pat could hear the pounding of his own heart and another sound almost hidden by the noise in his breast he thought that stairs were squeaking under a stealthy foot end of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen of the Great Pearl Secret》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Siobhan McKelpin. Chapter Seventeen The Crystal 
"'Have you an appointment, madam?' asked the elderly woman, who opened the door of Madame Vino's flat for Juliet. She was a person of almost oppressively respectable appearance, with gray hair parted in the middle, gold rim prince nays resting on a thin nose, and a neat body clad in black silk. If Madame Vino needed a chaperone, her door opener was ideal. Juliet had run upstairs so fast that she was breathing hard, passing the office of the inner circle had disgusted her she felt contaminated almost ill but the sight of this woman was like a dash of cool water on a hot forehead i have no appointment she answered but i came because of a message i'm the duchess of clernemay please to walk in madam said the woman without any evidence of being impressed i will give you a private room to wait in they stood in a hall, white-paneled, carpeted with red. The spruce-black silk figure threw open a door, and Juliet entered a tiny room, hardly more than a closet. The only furnishing consisted of a luxurious easy-chair, a table on which there were magazines and a box of cigarettes, and on the wall a mirror. This mirror was opposite the chair, and behind the chair was a second door, any one opening that door would see a reflected image of the sitter in the chair. As Juliet sank into the chintz-covered depths, the murmur of voices reached her. She thought, in fact, that she had heard sounds from two rooms, one on each side of the tiny cubicle in which she had been put to wait. This little hole is for special visitors, she told herself. Probably that woman was ordered to bring me here if I came. Madame Vino's room must be on the right side of this, and it's her voice I hear on the side, talking to a client. On the left, I suppose, it's the ordinary waiting room, full of people jabbering to each other about Madame Vino and, and the wonderful things they've heard about her from their friends. Or else it's the room where they keep up the practice of manicuring clients' nails. But I'm sure she means to sneak me in ahead of them. Julia was right in less than ten minutes there was a click of a latch and the door opposite the mirror opened in the long glass her eyes met the smiling ones of a pale dark woman with a clever somewhat common face there was nothing mystic about her appearance but on the other hand there was nothing meretricious no attempt at eastern allurements Juliet had already guessed from the ordinary furnishing of the flat that Madame Vino's metier was clean, straightforward frankness, as opposed to the cult of dim rooms, purple curtains, and incense. Now this impression was confirmed. The one false note was a heavy perfume such as some women adore and are unable to resist. "'I'm glad to see you, Duchess,' said the woman." i hoped you would call and i'm going to slip you in before the others who are waiting their turn they won't know so no harm's done will you come into my room she spoke cheerfully briskly rather more like an englishwoman than an american and juliet wondered if she were an english jewess the door led into an alcove of a fair-sized room decorated in green it was as little as possible like the mysterious sanctum of an ordinary fortune-teller or crystal gazer juliet had seen two or three of these in several countries they had always been egyptian or at least reminiscent of leon baxt this might have been any woman's boudoir but when madame vino had drawn the thin green curtains the place seemed to fill with an emerald dusk like the dusk of dreams or the green dimness under sea. I suppose you think I'm not very psychic, the mistress of the room remarked, placing a chair for her visitor on a table covered with a square of green velvet. People do think that. Then, when they've consulted me, they're surprised sometimes. They get better results than from those who go in for what I call scenery, you know what I mean? Yes, said Juliet. I suppose I do know. All I want to put me in the right frame of mind is green, explained Madame Vino. This kind of green twilight. She switched away the velvet covering from the table. Underneath was a cushion and a crystal which reflected the prevailing color. Then she sat down opposite the Duchess. 
the countess told you what happened when i was looking into the crystal for her she asked madame de saintville said that you saw something which concerned me but how do you know it concerned me your face came into the crystal i've seen your photograph and recognized you besides i felt i felt you were in great trouble what else did you see in the crystal let me look again now you are here and see if the same thing comes as she spoke madame vino bent forward and gazed closely into the transparent ball on a black base some moments passed in dead silence juliet watched the woman's features which became fixed and mask-like suddenly madame vino started slightly and began to speak i see a handsome young man very charming it is your husband duchess he is lying ill in a poor room it seems to be a kind of a cellar he tosses about he is delirious he calls for you i know that because at the same time i see the picture i hear his voice the name is juliet i think he has had an accident but i i can't see what it was i only know that he has hurt his head i feel the pain myself and i feel what he is thinking about you and something else ah a rope of pearls now i get a whisper it comes to me from his thoughts he went in search of something that was lost a thing of great value yes the pearls did he get them juliet asked mechanically she had little if any faith in the woman but a faint thrill ran through her she could not help being slightly impressed by the seeress's change of manner and the hypnotized look in her eyes he got them and then they were taken away but they are in the house where he is it is not a good house it is a house of thieves ah i must find out where it is or i can do you no good or else if i cannot find the house i must will the man who has got the pearls to communicate with me i see him plainly why shouldn't he communicate with me asked juliet will power doesn't act like that explained madame vino i could create a cord between another intelligence and my own not between two outside intelligences ah the picture has faded from the crystal but it will come again and for the moment we've seen enough i have the man's face clearly before my eyes i will concentrate upon him as i have never concentrated before i feel sure of the power to draw him to me how juliet inquired i can't tell yet he may be impelled to consult me about his future to have his luck foretold that's the light i will work on in exerting influence i shall remember his face from the crystal i can't make a mistake once i get him here i shan't hesitate to use hypnotism if that succeeds i'll phone you to come round at once with a detective said juliet madame vino's face changed flushing slightly over its sallowness oh no duchess she explained emphatically that wouldn't do at all women in my profession can't encourage detectives to come spying into their methods so far i've never had any trouble but i've had to be very careful detectives are the enemy i shall be very sorry indeed to be disobliging but i'm afraid i must let this business drop unless you give me your word not to bring a detective into it indeed i think i must ask you not to bring any third party if you promise this i don't think i'm conceited in saying i can positively make you an important promise in return by my will power i will do for you what no detective on this earth could do i'll draw into your circle the man who has got your husband lying helpless in this house and who has got your pearls do you believe i am able to do this or do you not i can't say i quite believe juliet confessed she might have been more definite yet not had gone beyond the truth she might have said what i think is that you're a trickster 
there's anything in this at all beyond mere nonsense, you know where my husband is, and you're playing a deep game for money. But something warned the girl not to say this. She was afraid to say it, afraid to make the seeress afraid. If Pat had been kidnapped, and this woman were a cat's paw of those who wanted a ransom, Juliet was willing to pay. If only Pat were true, if only he hadn't left her of his own free will for the love of Lida, she would give every penny she had in the world to get him back, and not grudge it. She reflected hastily that, if Madame Vino took her for a fool, it would be better to let it go at that, rather than risk losing a chance, possibly the only chance, of saving Pat. As for telling Jack and Sanders secretly, this course must be decided later. There was surely no more harm in deceiving such a woman than in tricking a dangerous animal, so far as moral principles were concerned. The one question was, could Madame Vino safely be deceived, or would she find a way of forcing a promise to be kept? That question was answered at once. I don't blame you, said Madame, with a good-natured smile. These great forces of nature are beyond belief to those who haven't tested them. But I know by experience what I can do. I know also what I can't do. I can do nothing if the people whose interests I serve work against me consciously or unconsciously. Now, I read your mind as I read the crystal. I see you're thinking whether or not to make a mental reservation about that promise. Well, I don't want to control you, Duchess, though I could do so. But if you bring anyone into this, the whole effort will be in vain. I might get the man we want here. I might hypnotize him to the point of speaking out. I might phone you. And yet, if you weren't alone, or if someone were spying outside, my power over him would break like that. She snapped her fingers together, her black eyes holding Juliet's. Now, she went on when she'd gotten her effect. I'm going to give you a proof of good faith. My fee for a consultation, just an ordinary one, not a special like this, is $25. No, don't take out your purse, Duchess. I won't accept a cent unless I bring off the stunt. The rest is up to you. Very well, said Juliet, on a sudden resolution. Let it be so. I'll promise what you ask, and I'll keep my promise. If you send for me, I'll come alone and I'll tell nobody. But I'm not a child. I must protect myself in some way. When I start for your place next time, I shall leave a letter for my cousin, Captain Manners, to be delivered by hand if I'm not back in two hours after leaving home. In the letter, I shall tell him everything. But it won't be sent if all goes right. So if you play fair, you've nothing to dread. Unless the letter should be sent to your cousin by mistake. My maid is a very intelligent woman, said Juliet. She doesn't make mistakes. Oh, you'll leave the letter with your maid, echoed Madame Vino. Yes, do you agree to the arrangement? I do, returned Madame. Juliet rose to go. She was feeling intensely excited, if not really hopeful. Even if there were a plot, it seemed as if it might be the best way of setting to work and she saw herself beating Sanders as a detective. So far he had made only trifling discoveries, fingerprints on the safe which told nothing. Since they were Pat and Lida Pavoyas, there were no clues which might solve the mystery of Pat's disappearance or lead to finding the lost pearls. As for Jack, he was Lida's man now. He believed the story which explained the fingerprints. She, Juliet, might soon show these two men that alone she had accomplished more than either in solving the double mystery. End of chapter 17、Chapter、18 of The Great Pearl Secret This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria de Fatima da Silva. The Great Pearl Secret by Charles Norris Williamson. Chapter 18 The Bargain. Two days passed, and small as Juliet's faith in Madame Vino, she did not stir from the house lest the woman should telephone in her absence. The strain of constant suspense was like a screw tightening her nerves to breaking point. Her irritation grew against Jack, who persisted in warning her that she would repent her suspicions of Lida Pavoya. To his mind, apparently, the dancer's story accounted for everything. Lida had volunteered a statement that she had touched the safe after Claremana opened it, and she had offered to give Sanders her own fingerprints in order that they might be identified with those taken on the door of the safe, the only ones found there with the exception of the Duke's. Even this fact, that there should be no other marks visible, didn't prejudice Jack against the siren. According to him, and he said to Sanders, the real thief or thieves had used rubber gloves. As for Sanders, he tried to calm the Duchess's impatience by assuring her that everything possible was being done. He even had a theory. But of what comfort was that to her, as he refused to tell her what it was until, or if, he could obtain positive proof? It hardly interested Juliet that he should have cabled Monsieur Mayen and learned in reply that there was no scratch on the duplicate ring given Mayen by Pat. She hadn't for a moment supposed there would be. Of course, it merely made matters worse that Mayen should be left-handed and that a specimen seal he sent by cabled request should have an entirely different appearance from those on the covering of the packet. Also, it seemed stupid rather than intelligent that de Fasquel should be watched. The detective admitted that the Frenchman seemed above suspicion. He had begged the Duke to open the packet in his presence, which alone proved his innocence, as Sanders couldn't help seeing. Besides, the French police had replied to a wired demand for de Fasquel's dossier by saying that he was a person of unblemished character. He appeared to deserve the trust reposed in him by Monsieur Mayen, had saved up a little money and was engaged to a pretty girl with a good dot, the daughter of a hotel keeper in Marseille. Not only that, de Fasquel was remaining in New York for the purpose of giving what aid he could. Altogether, Juliet considered that Sanders's activities were disappointing, and Jack's no better. She refused to meet Lida and talk with her in person, as Jack advised her to do, and between her sense of being deserted and her desperate anxiety for the truth about Pat, she found more and more that her thoughts clung to the broken reed of hope held out by Madame Vino. At last, when she was making up her mind to see the woman again without waiting longer, the message came. Juliet was in the act of answering a letter from Nancy Van Esten, begging her to be at the dress rehearsal for the great show, which was to benefit the Armenians. There was an undertone of friendly insistence, which Juliet understood very well. Nancy knew what people were saying about Pat and Pavoya and the Pearls. If she, Juliet, refused to attend this rehearsal to which all her most intimate pals were going, everyone would draw certain conclusions. She hated to go, but had written to say that she'd drop in about five o'clock. The rehearsal had to be in the afternoon, as the roof garden theatre was wanted in the evening for the last night of a review when the telephone bell rang almost in her ear. She picked up the receiver from the writing table, and her heart leapt 
at the sound of Madame Vino's voice. Is that you yourself, Duchess? Yes. Well, he's here. Can you come around at once? Yes, said Juliet, and putting down the receiver, had begun to get ready when she remembered the letter which ought to be left for Jack. There was no time, after all, to write details. She ought to have had the note ready for emergencies, but it hadn't occurred to her till now. Hurriedly, she jotted down the address of Madame Vino and a request to Jack to send there. Then, when she had scrawled Captain Manners, Tarascon Hotel, and sealed the envelope, the Duchess rang for her maid. "'I'm going out, Simone,' she said. "'It's now 4.30.' If I'm not back by 6.30, it will mean that, that I must miss an appointment with Captain Manners. So at that time, take this to his hotel yourself. He tells me that he's always at home between 6.30 and 7.30, so he's sure to be there. But if not, you can ring up Mr. Sanders at his private address, which I'll jot down for you, and ask him to call for Captain... Manners's letter, which concerns his business as well. I expect to come in much sooner, however, in which case you will simply hand this envelope back to me. You quite understand? I quite understand, Madame la Duchesse, echoed Simone, pinning on her mistress's hat and handing her a pair of gloves. So well did she understand that, the moment Juliet was out of the house, the car having been ordered, she examined the back of the said envelope. In her hurry, Juliet had not sealed it firmly. The flap was still wet and came loose with almost ridiculous ease. Simone had been somewhat surprised by the Duchess's instructions. Her reason for wishing to acquaint herself with the contents of the letter but she was still more surprised by the letter itself. The Duchess was going to Madame Vino's, evidently to keep an engagement already made, and it would seem that she considered herself in some danger. Could Madame Vino mean to give away Mademoiselle Amaranthe's connection with the inner circle? Simone told herself that this was an absurd and far-fetched suspicion because it was not probable that Madame Vino knew anything about her activities. Besides, why should the woman, even if she knew them, betray valuable secrets of the paper and its best correspondence? It was but an idea born of an uncomfortable conscience, another name for fear. Juliet was admitted to Madame Vino's flat by the respectable creature in black silk who had impressed her so favorably two days before. Again, she was taken into the cubicle of a private waiting room, and there Madame came at once from her own room. He's still here, she announced, having closed the door. Everything is wonderful, but different from what I expected. Who is the man? Juliet abruptly asked. I don't know. I haven't been able yet to make him tell me that. He seemed so obstinate that I thought I'd better extract more important details first, in case in his struggles not to obey I should lose my control of him, which does happen now and then in such experiments. You mean to tell me that this man, whoever he is, actually came to you from heaven knows where because you willed him to come and that you hypnotized him to find out about my husband. I mean just that, answered Madame Vino triumphantly. I've done this sort of thing before. It's the secret of my success over other psychics. I found out that your husband was kidnapped, just as I thought. As for the pearls, so far as I can understand, he had them on him. Anyhow, they're in these people's possession. But you'd better come into my room and talk to the man. Is he still hypnotized? Juliet wanted to know, irritated by her feeling that she was being deceived, yet eager and curious. No, not now. I've released him from the influence. He was going pale about the lips, which shows a weak heart, and I was scared. I can't take big risks of that sort. But when I explained what I'd got out of him, 
and when i'd even made him put on paper a short statement of his own handwriting he saw that he might as well be frank if the statement was signed you must have got his name and if not what use is it he thinks he's signed it for i covered up the place where the name should be as if accidentally and snatched the paper away as though i was afraid he'd grab it for me it was when i was willing him so hard to sign that he began to look queer so i had to give it up i see said juliet well take me into the next room and let me try what i can get out of him you can get everything out of him duchess and you can get back your husband and your pearls that is if you're willing to pay the price this man asks even in his sleep he was firm about that and he hasn't told where the duke is juliet did not believe that the man knew where the duke was it was so much more likely that the whole business was a trick to extract money and give nothing of value in return still she was more eager to see the occupant of madame vino's room than she had ever been to see any one except pat in the blessed old days the green curtains were drawn and though twilight was falling out of doors the only lamp was a small green shaded one on the table of the crystal the man who stood facing the two women as they entered was in shadow all except his hands which showed white and large crossed on folded arms it was an instant before juliet realized that something more than shadow obscured the features then her piercing eyes made out that a layer of black crape was drawn across them as far up as the forehead as far down as the mouth beneath this mask a beard protruded like a fringe but juliet told herself it might be false oh you have masked yourself exclaimed madame vino he wasn't masked when i left him duchess juliet made no comment though if the man and woman were in collusion it was probable the madame lied there's no objection to my being masked i suppose said the man i have a right to protect myself does he speak rather like an englishman or do i imagine it juliet wondered i don't object she said aloud i don't care who you are if you can give me news of my husband and if if you can bring him back to me i can give you news now the man replied and you can have him back tomorrow night if you choose what are your conditions juliet asked one million dollars for the duke and the pearls oh said the duchess and what for the duke without the pearls we don't treat separately indeed and what if i refuse to treat at all in that case you'll never see your husband again on this side the grave you mean you'll murder him if i don't pay ransom not at all this is the duke's own affair he's in it with us that is the man spoke quickly when anger flamed on juliet's face and he must have feared that she would cease bargaining for a man capable of holding up his wife that is he's in it to this extent he's taken an oath not to give us away he was hurt in an accident an affair neither he nor you would like to have come out and i and a friend of mine saved his life when we'd done that as we're poor men we didn't see why we shouldn't get something for ourselves we're amateurs at these things my mate and i and we were at odds how to approach you madam without risking trouble then i had a hunch to consult this lady dreamed about her felt i must come madame vino gave juliet a look now i find she was mesmerizing me or something of the sort but she's given me good advice and she's brought you and me together so maybe all's well that ends well where's my husband asked juliet where i live and you could have me followed all around new york without finding out where that is i'm up to every dodge of that kind i can tell you but what my friend and i the duke standing by us because of what we've done for him what we propose is this you get hold of a million dollars without telling anyone what the money's for we'll know if you play is false we have our spies it must be all in notes 
then if this lady madame vino is willing to see the thing through you'll bring to her flat the whole sum only with the notes cut in two that plan is to prove my good faith an hour after the duke shall arrive with the pearls in an auto at your own house and the remaining halves of the notes shall be handed to the chauffeur by you in person before your husband leaves the car does that scheme look good to you juliet paused for an instant but not to consider the money question for she would have given not one million but all the millions she possessed to have pat with her alive and safe nor did she now care a straw whether or not these two creatures were in a plot together she hesitated only because it seemed too good to be true that pat should be given back to her so easily she had suffered so much had realized so bitterly her need of him guilty or innocent that she was actually dazzled by the man's offer and when she had calmed herself by drawing a deep breath or two she answered yes it seems good to me then it is good all right how soon can you do this how soon can you get hold of the money tomorrow of course it's too late today tomorrow then come here at this same time can you manage that i will manage it juliet said she remembered that she had written to nancy van esten meaning to attend the rehearsal the letter wasn't posted yet but she would send it and go to the theater for a few minutes from there she would come here to madame vino's no one could think then that she had avoided meeting Lida pavoya but if she had a pressing engagement to keep it wouldn't be her fault if there were no time for introductions besides jack manners and sanders were supposed to be coming tomorrow afternoon to discuss some new detail in the duke's study what juliet didn't know the rehearsal would give her an excuse for absence while they were there and as it was to meet lida jack would be pleased to have her go remember madam if you don't keep the business strictly to yourself the duke won't materialize the man in the mask went on i assure you not on my honor because that's a minus quantity to you but on your husband's you can take my word for this and furthermore if you attempt to trick us you'll never have a chance again if there were as little chance of your tricking me as of my tricking you juliet exclaimed i should be happy be happy then retorted the man the thing settled i'm off and i'll tell the duke that you send him a good message he was out of the room before juliet had realized that he meant to suit his action to his word with a wild impulse she would have sprung after him to ask other questions but the door slammed in her face she was too late and besides what would have been gained by keeping the man a moment more i don't think there's anything further to do or say but let him go quietly madame vino advised juliet turned upon her i believe you're in this she cried the elder woman smiled indulgently as at a petulant child my dear i'm not she said but i can't prove that if you don't want to take my word oh well it doesn't matter juliet sighed what do i owe you for your services what you think they're worth pay me tomorrow madame replied tomorrow it seemed that juliet could not live till then end of chapter eighteen